Hello, this is Ralph Indiodad with a very special program for you. One that marks a rather unusual 50th anniversary. And the truth is, it's a 50th anniversary that Guyana clearly don't need to celebrate. It's the signing on the 17th of February, 1966, of the Geneva Agreement. What is the Geneva Agreement? How has it been a burden and a bane to this country for the past 50 years that it's shared its independence with its citizens? Well, to discuss that, the implications, the impact, the ramifications, if you like, of the Geneva Agreement, I have with me a distinguished panel of learned and well-known diplomats. First of all, almost the dean of the diplomats in the Caribbean, Latin America, and I can say the world, I have some sisri that ramful. A world-renowned diplomat, the longest-serving Commonwealth Secretary General. He was a firmer, former Attorney General and Foreign Minister of Ghana during the 60s and early 70s, when, of course, much of the discussion was around the Geneva Agreement, and then went on to serve the region, the Commonwealth, the UN, as one of uh, the most distinguished and internationally respected diplomats in the world. So we're very pleased to have Sir Sridad with us today. Also with us, we have Ambassador Cedric Joseph. Ambassador Joseph is an outstanding scholar and historian in his own right, but he was a former head of the Presidential Secretariat and also a retired career diplomat at various posts from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here and undertook a number of assignments on behalf of Guyana and the international community during his career. We also have Ambassador Ronald Austin, who has been with the Foreign Service in Guyana. He's now retired, but still assisting in an advisory position, has been with that uh, Foreign Service for about 35 years or so, reaching the level of ambassador. So we are indeed fortunate to have uh, not only the the long career and knowledge of these distinguished gentlemen, but we have their acquaintance and relationship uh, to the Geneva Agreement. None so close, and I've been told by our two other colleagues, that maybe the only living person today <laughs> who had witnessed the signing of the Geneva Agreement. So let me pose to Sir Sridat Ramphal the hardest of questions. In a nutshell, Sasridad, what is the Geneva Agreement and why in any person's name was Guyana a signatory to that agreement even before it was an independent state? Well, it's a difficult question to answer in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, but it was, in a sense, an essential part of the larger picture of Guyana's independence because it centered around a rather outrageous claim by Venezuela to more than half of Guyana. <coughs> Guyana was on the cusp of independence. We were about to be free. And Venezuela, who now is very proud of its Bolivarian tradition, did a very un-Bolivarian thing. They basically tried to forestall Guyana's independence. They didn't put it like that. But they, they went after Britain, because of course Britain was the colonial power, uh, agitating this claim and putting it in the context of Guyana's independence in the sense that they were contending 
that this has to be dealt with and governed away and settled before Guyana could become independent. Now, Britain resisted that, resisted it strongly. And from their point of view, and of course from Guyana's, from, from British Guyana's point of view, there was no question about it. We were going to be independent uh, when we eventually were. But in the diplomatic processes of resolving the environment in which Guyana would become independent, Britain arranged for this meeting of representatives of Britain and Venezuela and of the to be independent Guyana. Uh, and it took place in Geneva. Uh, it took place, as we, as, as we now all know, on the 17th uh, of February. Well, the, the 16th and 17th, the, the agreement was signed on the 17th. Uh, between Britain and Venezuela, and Britain invited the new government, uh, Mr. Burnham's government, the government that would be taking over independence, to be at the meeting because Guyana, the new Guyana would inherit whatever would be the conclusions of the meeting. Uh, and the agreement, in fact, says so, that attending the meeting uh, were Britain and Venezuela and representatives of British Guyana, which, as Guyana, would become party to the agreement on independence. As you said, I was there. Probably the only one around who was. <laughs> And, uh, of course, I recall it well, uh, the occasion. Uh, and it was a maddening occasion, because this was something so much of the past that it should have been of the past, yeah. uh, and should not have been, even in our thoughts as we looked ahead. But Venezuela was adamant, was threatening, uh, and had to be little to it. And, and so, the Geneva Agreement is the result. And as, as you emphasized, <clears throat> we had to sign it if we wanted our independence. Yes. To put it in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Uh, well, the interesting thing about the this claim was that, and I'm going to Ambassador Joseph now, because he's a recorded historian um, and he has written a tome, I'm told, on, on this particular issue. Ambassador Joseph, for about 50 years or more, there was really no contention to the legitimacy of Guyana's borders. Can you give us the, the backdrop to that story? Yes, I do. I'm going to need a slightly larger nutshell. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you about five minutes nutshell. To put together four centuries of activities. First, the successor states of Spain, as in Africa and in Europe, all had frontiers unmarked. And the possibility of conflict was strong. Frontier disputes were to a large extent a way of life. And so you had to sit down and demarcate them. Round about the early part of the 19th century, I'm going to skip the 17th and the 18th with the counterclaims between Spain and the Netherlands. Round about that time, with the discovery of gold there was a greater urgency to delimit the frontier between Venezuela, which has got its independence from Spain, and British Guiana, and then under the control of the United Kingdom. It has to be understood that in the 19th century, Great Britain was a major power in the Western Hemisphere, and perhaps 
serious rival to the burgeoning United States. It had naval bases in Halifax, Halifax, Nova Scotia, of Bermuda, Port Royal, and Jamaica. I was furiously maneuvering within Central America. The canal had not been constructed at the time, but there were serious discussions about construction across Nicaragua. Britain was part of that, a part of that discussion. Venezuela, from about 1850, 1860, declared appeal to the United States for assistance in pressing, pressing Britain to demarcate the frontier. She wanted an arbitration to establish the, the rights claims of the two states. The Venezuela's claims lay specifically in the principle of discovery, the so-called discovery. It was a wide claim over a very wide terrain. Britain, like Holland before, their claim was based upon the occupation, well, upon the conquest first, occupation and control. Britain was very adamant and very resentful of submitting any territory to arbitration. But a great deal of pressure came from the United States. And serious intervention at the level of the president, President Cleveland, and in 1894, 1895, there was a major crisis in Anglo-American relations over the Venezuelan and treaties for support from the United States. An arbitration agreement was, was reached, and an arbitration panel came into play in Paris during the summer of 1899. That panel sat for 53 sessions and examined all the historical, available historical evidence all the maps, all the claims, and the counterclaims. Generally, there were two schools of submissions. One by the American lawyers who were chosen by Venezuela to represent them. They founded their case on the principle of discovery. And what they saw were the rights emanating from these principles. Britain, like all other European powers, France, Portugal, and the Netherlands, re had rejected this theory and felt that you couldn't establish a claim of discovery to such huge swathes of, of territory. And their claims were based on occupation and control, control over the peoples who were living in the area at the time. In the end, after the examination, the arbitrators, two from Britain, two from the United States, but one selected on behalf of, of Venezuela. The chairman was a Russian jurist, a very eminent Russian jurist at the time. And after 53 sessions, he determined a border between Venezuela and the territory of British Guiana. That was a unanimous decision of the panel. It was accepted, perhaps regretfully from Venezuela, accepted by the United States, accepted by the international, international, international governments, and having projected border on paper, an Anglo-Venezuelan team went ahead after 1899 and drew that border on the ground and signed on both sides accepting the physical delimitation of the border as established 
by the panel in 1899. That border corresponds to the present border. And that is the border that is internationally recognized. International maps also reproduce that border. Venezuela accepted that border. Of course, it has been a general pattern in, in Latin America, in South America, I should say, perhaps, after many of these arbitral tribunals and delimited borders, the losing side will always shed some tears, some more powerfully than the other. But in the end, they went away and sought other means of reacting to such decision. But the bottom line, uh, Ambassador, is that the, uh, in 1899, it was a fixed and final... Fixed and final, the settlement, the, the treaty that Venezuela accepted in 19, 1897 was that this tribunal will meet, examine the documents, delimit the border, and the decision of that tribunal will be full, perfect, and final. It wasn't a feature generally used in American deliberations. But the United States thought, let's bring in this European feature because of the recurring controversies that had been occurring. And that was very peculiar insertion in 1897. Venezuela accepted that full, perfect, and final settlement. And there is the question, should <laughs> remain settled? Move from 1899, drawing of the maps, some grouses here and there. And it was not until 1962, on the eve, of, well, long eve of our dependence, triggered by a junior consul of Venezuela, several Malet Prevost, who gave what he thought he recollected of pressures exerted by the Russian chairman on the team of arbitrators to arrive at the frontier. He was the only person alive, as Sashridat is, the only person alive from the Geneva Agreement. But, but the difference is that Sashridat is telling us his story while he's alive. <laughs> Mr. Severo Palev made his claims and locked him up and asked for the publication only after, after his death. <clears throat> Significantly, his claims were made the very year after he was honored by Venezuela with the treaty, the, 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 the award of, of the liberator. And from there, there are the inklings, the pinkling of the, op of the reopenings from 1962. It should not have reached that stage the Geneva Agreement with the response to that nibbling away at the integrity of an internationally recognized, recognized decision. That's, that's a really good uh, background because Sasrida so talked about uh, 1966 and the 17th of February and you gave us the full fabric before that happened and why it happened that way. Um, but just to, to summarize, 1899, 63 years, Venezuela officially and universally accepted the borders as they were finalized in 1899. I participated in other acts, like the delimitation of the meeting lines of Guyana, Venezuela, and Brazil in 1932. Okay. That was surely an affirmation That's right. of the border established in Paris. Before I come back to Sasridat, because we've, we, we, we have to press Sasridat to give us all the information while he is still here, <laughs> and you will be here for a long time, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to go across to Ambassador um, Austin, because uh, before we started chatting, um, we were talking about how difficult it is for Venezuela now um, to even pull back on its claim. Uh, can you expand a little bit on that? Because there was no claim for 63 years. Then this claim, three years be before our independence. Um, but then what happened in between then and now? 
and why is it so difficult for them to face reality that the finality of the border was done, finished, perfect, as the historian <laughs> said in 1899? Well, I think, um, well, I, I must say, that having listened to Sir Sridhar and um, Cedric, I feel somewhat intimidated by the vast knowledge that both men possess. But Venezuela's problem is that um, after the reopening of the, the, the demarcation of the, of the borders, they virtually backed themselves into a corner, and it is a, a process that is still going on. And they've educated the public to believe that they've been cheated out of their out of territory, which, according to them, um, should have gone to them. In fact, what they have done is to reject the 1899 um, uh, award, 63 years later. later, and then to proceed to educate, as I said, their people. I mean, they, if, if, if and one must um, concede and give Venezuela some credit, that this process has been intense, has been relentless, and has been going, been going on for a very, very long period. And when you do meet Venezuelan diplomats, um, whether it's, it's a, an ordinary member of their um, embassy in various parts of the world or the senior officials, this is at the forefront of their minds, their thinking, as you saw recently with the, the Venezuelan foreign minister. And recently on the Chavez, I think, has been made a part of the, the Constitution that the border, that they do not recognize uh, Ghana's borders. And if there's going to be any pullback or change on the part of Venezuela, it has to go to some kind of referendum or some kind of major um, political process in Venezuela. So they're in a difficult position. It is hard for, I don't think any Venezuelan government at the present time can say, let us settle this matter and survive in, uh, over a period of 24 hours. Um, it's in the schools, as I said, I think, and I think Cedric knows this very well. The Navy in Venezuela has a special department which um, has a mandate to study this issue on a regular basis. And I, my understanding is there's an admiral who's in charge of this division, which is within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, they make it a uh, focus. They study every single aspect of the, the controversy. Um, and they're quite um, tuned to believe that um, they've been cheated out of their territory, which they thought might have gone to them. Well, we, we, that's, that's part of the, the risk they took in, in, in going the way they did. But, of course, we're here to discuss Guyana's options. Um, before I go back to Sasridat, though, and, and, and go back to the rather questionable anniversary that we're, we're observing, uh, not celebrating, mind you, the signing of the uh, Geneva Agreement 50 years ago, I just want to remind you, if you're just joining us, that we are talking about the Geneva Agreement which was signed on the 17th of February, 1966, <clears throat> mere months before Guyana officially gained its independence. We were British Guyana at the time, uh, but we, the, the representatives of Guyana in the form of uh, uh, Forbes Burnham, the, the Prime Minister at the time, um, he's, he signed that agreement. So Sridhar Ramphal, who is here with us today, uh, also was at that signing. So he's giving us first-hand information. And uh, what we want to do is to turn back to the Geneva Agreement. And so, Sridhar, if I can come back to you, sir, uh, there has been, to my mind, especially from one side of the, the signatory table, uh, a, a reinterpretation and, and, and a misinterpretation, and one thinks rather deliberately, of the agreement that, that, that says and announces that Guyana cannot utilize um, the resources and the territory that that one side is 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 claiming uh, is that is that well, anywhere that, in the Geneva Agreement? <laughs> it, it, is, it is a polite word to describe that uh, as a misinterpretation. Mm. It, it, it is a it is it is a, it is a very callous uh, and and very contrived. Uh, presentation of what the Geneva Agreement is all about. Ronald used a word just now that is very pertinent. He, he mentioned the controversy. Mm. And that word is important even today. 
because the Geneva Agreement talked about the controversy uh, and set out uh, procedures by which that controversy uh, could be settled. And it, it almost defined what controversy was. The controversy was the, the row, the dispute that arose out of their contention that the arbitral award that Ambassador Joseph spoke about from the arbitral tribunal in 1899, that that arbitral award was null and void because of their, their account deriving from Malle Prevost, the lawyer he told you about, all those years ago, that was the controversy, that the award on which the boundary is based was null and void. Now they're saying, 50 years later, that the controversy, that that controversy was more or less set aside at Geneva, uh, and the, the controversy it's really Venezuela's old historical claim, and you're not to worry with the with the award. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you took that issue to any international law body, it would be rejected out of hand. So when I say what they should do is establish what they're talking about, knowing that they can't talk about that, they f reformulate the question to talk about something else. <laughs> now, the only way this, this matter has gone on for 50, 50 years, uh, we have tried all manner of means, a mixed commission, even a moratorium, uh, commissions that have sat down and looked at them, they have not produced a shred of evidence or even of argument mm -hmm. that that award is bad, is wrong, must be set aside. They jump over it and go back to what they think is a historical right of, of the colonial era. Mm. Venezuela's claim really rests on Spanish colonialism. And, you know, it's, it's so far out of tune with not only modernity, but with what the Venezuelans talk about rightly, because he was a great Latin American patriot, to talk about Bolivar. This is the very opposite of what Bolivar would be would be seeking after, which is Guyana's freedom. Now, the only way this can be resolved, because as Ronald said, they've boxed themselves into a corner and they can't find a way of conceding it, is to have it settled by the highest international tribunal. It's a legal issue. It's a legal contention. It can, must be settled, if it's settled at all, by the highest tribunal in the world. And that is the International Court of Justice. Uh, and Guyana has said, uh, I, I believe rightly, and has said it strongly, that that is the direction in which it must go. Fortunately, the Geneva Convention provides a means for this to happen. Because it has an effect, if the parties can't agree, the Secretary General of the United Nations the means can uh, decide from the means provided in the Charter how it can be settled. And it names them, conciliation, mediation, all the things we've done, ending with arbitration or judicial settlement. Judicial settlement is the International Court of Justice. And so Guyana says, we call on the Secretary General of the United Nations to help the world to be rid of this source of conflict, 
to help Guyana to be rid of this impediment to development by going to the court. It's a bold and courageous thing to do, but we are so confident that justice is on the side of Guyana that it is the proper thing to do. And that is where matters stand now. Uh, so that the Geneva Agreement is the machinery through which Guyana can have this resolved by the ICJ. So, in a way, the Geneva Agreement continues to have relevance, but at this stage, after 50 years, it's a, relevant, a relevance that can move us to the end That's right. of the process. It's the means to finality. And heaven knows Guyana needs to be rid of, the, uh, of this incubus. I'm the just going to... I was wondering... Yes, if, please come, come back in. So, should have touched on... Um, well, in further implied, as he was speaking um, earlier, the Venezuelans have been quite reckless. I mean, they've breached that agreement um, on so many occasions um, that one wonders if they would ever honor any, any international agreement that is presented before them, except if, if, they, if they, um, the international court rules um, in, um, in Ghana's favor. But um, so should that we remember that when the mixed commission was meeting, um, Ancoca was occupied. And you had, you know, several um, uh, incidents uh, involving uh, Venezuela um, on the border, and that is something I think it's a good thing that we, we're uh, looking at Geneva um, af after 50 years, and it tells you it tells a story about Venezuela's irresponsible behavior and its desire to get what it wants, regardless of what methods um, it uses. It's something that Guyanese should understand because the Venezuelan controversy is an existential threat to, to this country. And every single Guyanese child, adult, must understand that. And if I can go, go now to Ambassador Joseph. So, in a way, we've, we've, we've seen a general path forward. How does Guyana, from your, your studies, um, Ambassador Joseph, how does Guyana move to that point, or have we already started to move to that point? We've already started to move to that point. I want to stress the argument, this advance by that on, on Venezuela's play game. Before the, the Geneva Agreement, there were four, year, four years of tentative discussions. But from the from late nineteen sixty five, it was quite clear that Venezuela wanted to rescind annul the arbitral award mm -hmm. and to have a equivalent given to Venezuela Plata. In drafting the agenda for Geneva, Britain went to all extents, prodded by Mr. Burnham and Sir Shrivet, that there will be no substantive discussion on the award. There was no territorial dispute or border dispute. Venezuela kept injecting that. And they were pressed into understanding that they have made a claim, a contention, that the award was not void. It is for you now to substantiate that contention. You see, Article 1 of the agreement spells it out quite clearly. Venezuela accepted that agreement under pressure, you may say, but I'm going to show you how Venezuela also contributed to the spirit of the agreement. And immediately after the signing of that agreement, from the mixed commission to this present day, Venezuela has virtually ignored the requirements of the agreement to substantiate its claim of nullity. of nullity and to advance arguments. Venezuela has reverted to the original historic position. Executable must be delivered, joint administration, joint contract. So there can be no more option that is premised on diplomacy, bilateral discussions, and so on. 
the only available option, as envisaged in the said agreement, has to be a judicial settlement. Certainly. You have now to submit the contention to a court of law. And there are rules. How do you nullify, how do you disregard an internationally accepted agreement of 116 years duration. How do you set that aside? That is the argument for Venezuela. For Guyana, argument or position has to be, one, we will not participate. We said it in 1966, all three years. There can be no substantial discussion, negotiations, talks on the arbitral award on the existing internationally recognized border. Two, it is for Venezuela to make its contention. Venezuela has resisted, has been disin shown disinclination of advancing that. Three, only a court of law can attest that situation. And those are the fundamental options. There are options, of course, we keep the subject alive, not just in Guyana, but before the international community, and particularly at the United Nations. I want to mention one particular point. Um, I've picked it up in my own research. Sir Shri was there, you probably recall, late in the night of the, of the 17th, late midnight, you're rushing around. You put together Article 4, which reflects Article 33 from the UN Charter. And that was a proposal from Venezuela. It's a Venezuelan paper who reminded about these means of settlement, Article 33 inserted. Then the final bit is that, to whom do we refer this matter, having gone through all these means and not arrived at the, at the conclusion? To whom do we refer this matter? The British side was opting for unnamed international organizations. But it was Venezuela who said the Secretary General of the United Nations. The Secretary General of the United Nations was the suggestion accepted by the team of the Venezuelans. And therein lies, it is the Secretary General's task now to, as spelled out in Article 4.1, we have I dare say, exhausted the talkative means of settlement. I say talkative. And the Secretary should now say, OK, there's no point another year or another six months. Let us move to a judicial settlement. The responsibility lies there. His own responsibility as Secretary of the United, of the United Nations. And then arising out of the agreement there, and Venezuela's endorsement at the time. Those are our options, to press the Secretary General to use his authority and to move the matter over to the International Court of Justice for what we hope will be now a definitive position on points of law. Venezuela has criticized the arbitral award as not being founded on law and more on compromise. And now, 117 years after, Venezuela is seeking to depart from its original argument about the absence of law and wants some kind of compromise, we know what they want after that compromise. But we want the law to determine the legal situation. Well, let's come back because uh, it's, it's almost uh, a, a, kind of a sort of natural circle to come back to one of the originals who uh, was at the signing of that agreement 50 years ago. And, and to, to ask you, Sister Dad, 50 years ago, Guyana this year is celebrating its 50th anniversary. From your own perspective, uh, as, as an international diplomat, as a scholar in all these business, but primarily as a Guyanese, what would you like to see uh, in, uh, as, as a, a proper conclusion to the Geneva Agreement 50 years later? I would like to see the fulfillment of the agreement. I would like to see, we are at the point where that article that calls for the Secretary General to act 
has come. I would like to see that activated. We have begun the discussion with the Secretary General. I would like to see that taken to completion and the Secretary General hand the resolution of the issue over to the International Court of Justice. And uh, as, a, as a final thought, uh, if Guyana finally gets rid of, I was going to say monkey on, on its back, <laughs> but that was objected to in places, uh, gets rid of this, this burdensome, uh, uh, this burdensome point of having to prove and prove and prove again, um, what do you think it will mean for Guyana and its future? Well, it will mean a great deal for, for the world, for the rule of law, for the sanctity of treaties, which is of importance to the whole world. It will mean everything for relations between Guyana and Venezuela. The people of Venezuela are good people. They are our brothers and sisters. Guyana has no quarrel with them. Guyana holds out the hand of friendship to them. They have been indoctrinated by their governments. So there are classes and forces in Venezuela that are keeping the peoples of these countries apart. And one of the great achievements of the settlement of this matter would be an opportunity for true friendship to develop uh, between the people of Guyana and the people of Venezuela, who we need, after all these years, to embrace as friends and neighbors. Thank you very much, sir. So the benefit is not really only to Guyana. No, it's to, it's to the world and yeah, all and the two people. The agreement anticipates that when it speaks of practical settlement. And to some extent, I venture to say that petro Karim was an indication of what that practical settlement can be if this spurious claim is dismissed. No, in addition to what Sashwida uh, said, Rick, um, we have lost a lot through Venezuela's economic aggression. If you had to put a price tag on um, the investments we've lost in, in the Sugabo, it must be um, astronomical. And if we could be free to that board and really bring the Sugabo into our, integrate it into our economic plans and development, I think it's going to make a tremendous difference mm. to the future of this country. Well, gentlemen, let me thank you uh, enormously on behalf of all of those who have been listening in and learning over the past little while uh, about not merely the uh, Geneva Agreement, but the circumstances in which that agreement came about and the burden that it continues to place on Guyana until we get a proper and final solution um, that, that Venezuela <laughs> accepts as well. Um, <coughs> So Sridhar Ramphil has been uh, one of the panelists, the most distinguished gentleman known all around the world. And we in Guyana, of course, are always very proud to say a son, a true son of Guyana. Please. Ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Joseph, Cedric Joseph, again, an outstanding scholar in his own right, uh, but also contributing to our foreign uh, service and foreign relations, and so did uh, a slightly younger member of the team, um, <laughs> Ambassador Ronald Austin. I want to thank you all very much. And it's almost fitting, as we close off here, to say that coming up immediately as I say thank you very much are the thoughts of the president of this country right now, uh, President David Granger, almost encapsulating what this panel has just said over the past little while. Thank you very much for joining us on this special program on the 50th anniversary of the Geneva Agreement. Robin Diodat saying so long. Your Excellency, Wednesday of next week will be 50 years since the Geneva Agreement was signed. 
and Venezuela is still to prove her claims. Your thoughts on this? Well, Venezuela never proved its claim because the claim has gone to arbitration, as you know, um, in 1899. And Venezuela was awarded over, I think, nearly 15,000 square kilometers of territory, uh, land about the size of Jamaica. So Venezuela has already gotten everything that uh, it's ever going to get. What Venezuela is doing or has done for the last 50 years is advance a false claim, a bogus claim, to more territory. And um, we decided to go to court. So I know it's the 50th anniversary of the um, Geneva Agreement, but the Geneva Agreement never attempted to overturn the decisions of the 1899 Tribunal. That is held up in international law, and we want to go to the courts to prove it. So the anniversary is very significant for me, for all Guyanese, but we must reaffirm our, our nation territorial integrity. We will, I am seeking a meeting with the United Nations um, to ensure that this message is, is gotten across. So I've already written on a couple of occasions to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and this is our message, that we are in the right, and we are going to go to court to prove that we are in the right so that our children could inherit the land. We come across the Caribbean Sea, mother, father, pick me, and we settle down in GT. Why, oh, we bend down on the coast of Flint, the hot sun and pouring rain, and we plant in the rice and cane. Why, oh, yes, we take off the boots and we put down the roots. Why, oh, for the crop would that grow in Essequibo is we. And the six o'clock we and the sake we is we own. And the lava that runs from Govaya, gone 